So my, my brief is 10 minutes and to be provocative, which won't be particularly difficult. Um, <laughs> I, I should add to my CV something that you may or may not know. I was one of the three people who founded the DSDM consortium, uh, which is one of the feeders into our job. Um, but because we were British, we met in a pub in Cheltenham for a meal one evening rather than a ski resort for a week, all right? But that's a, a different sort of environment. And um, I'd actually argue, and this is kind of like, DSDM was kind of like in some ways a, a better basis for our job because it was a multi-method approach and it was created by three companies who competed with each other. I mean, I sat down with my, I was data sciences, I sat down with my equivalent in Logica and with Ed from Cambridge. And we said, if three competitors create a standard, the market will accept it. So we didn't type, try and take proprietary advantage of a single method or tool and I think there's a lesson in that for the next generation of Agile and I'll come back to that at the end yeah um, so uh, four key things I want to talk about first of all one of the fundamental errors at the moment in Agile and IT is to assume a manufacturing framework or a manufacturing model and you see this in most of the language concepts like flow like Kanban and the assumption is the role of IT is to produce products at the end of some sort of production line. Now, part of the problem with that is it assumes that people know what they want. And in some cases they do. Um, but I was in IT for most of my life. And one of our basic sayings is, you know, you, you can do whatever you want. You can prove your users never want what you actually developed. You can prove it with entity models and user requirement diagrams. But the minute you deliver something, it turns out they want something different. And that, that's as true today as it was back in the 80s. And one of the reasons for that is the pace of progression of technology is faster than the pace of users' ability to define what they need. Yeah, so technology can do things. We call this unarticulated needs. So kind of like one of the key things, and we're doing a lot of work on this, is how do you map technology capability? not against articulated needs in a backlog, but against unarticulated needs where IT could make a strategic difference. Uh, and I'll come back to some methods and tools around that. And that's a key development, right? Um, the trouble is it's very satisfying just to clear a backlog and measure your flow and measure your capacity. The reality is technology is a strategic tool and weapon it's not a manufacturing process and it needs to take far more of, a, of an ecological metaphor. So that's, that's point number one. Um, point number two, and this comes from the whole work we do in complex adaptive systems. This is the Kinevin framework. Um, Scrum is 25 years old, I think, yesterday. Agile is 21 years old next, next year. And Kinevin is actually 21 years old um, as of last month. So there, there's a lot of things which had their genesis at the same time with multiple levels of, of overlap. But the key thing behind Kinevin is the concept that you're dealing with what's called a complex adaptive system. And the key difference between a complex system and an ordered system is that in a complex system, there is no linear causality. You can't say, if I do X, it will produce Y result. Yeah. You can say there's the plausibility that this thing will happen, but you can't guarantee that it will. And the reason for that, and this is the key phrase we're all using now, is that complex adaptive systems are entangled systems. Um, it's like if you look at a mangrove swamp, or, and I, I may need to translate colloquial English here, Alicia Gerraro says a complex adaptive system is like bramble bushes in a thicket. Yeah, so bramble bushes are those sort of thorny things which produce berries, and a thicket is a small wood. Right? Now, I, my hobby is rambling and walking. I have torn more, you know, lost more blood to bramble bushes in thickets walking than I've lost to blood donning on a regular basis, all right? It sort of takes its toll. But the point is, if you tug one bramble, you don't know what's going to happen elsewhere in the system. Right? So everything is connected and everything is entangled, but the results of making any change are not predictable in any meaningful sense. So we basically say complex adaptive systems are dispositional 
they're not causal. So I can measure their dispositions, I can measure their propensities, but I can't create a causal relationship. Now that has major implications because if a system isn't linear and causal, you can't treat it like a flow process. And one of the key things, and as most of you will know, I've thoroughly objected to SAFE from the day it first came out. Um, I famously wrote a blog post which said it was the infantilization of management. And I wrote that in deep anger one day in Poland and I've stuck by it ever since. And one of the reasons I think it's wrong is my argument against it is not empirical and that word is misused in our job. It, they actually mean phenomenological. Yeah, empirical means a scientific process. It doesn't mean what worked for me last time. Yeah, that, that's just called perception, right? Um, but basically, the, the, one of the things we know, and this is an a priori statement, is a complex adaptive system doesn't scale by imitation or by repetition. Right? It scales by decomposition and recombination. You think about it, if you think about organic life form, the whole of organic life comes from different combinations yeah, of, of four basic chemical compounds. The whole variety of organic life comes from that. So one of the key things if you want to scale agile is to actually decompose the various methods and ideas to their lowest level of what we call coherence and then them allow them to recombine. So to give you a simple example, a key element of Scrum as a method is a sprint. All right, so that's the lowest level. Now I might recombine a sprint with another method or I might make it three months rather than two weeks. You, know, you see what I start to do? I start to decompose what are the essential elements. I then start to change them and recombine them. And that way I get novelty. And of course you get some absurdities. I mean, I remember working with Telstra in um, Australia and they were doing waterfall projects. And as anybody will tell you, including Martin Fowler and including Google and everybody else, Agile doesn't work for major infrastructure projects where you know what you've got to deliver and it's just a bloody big project. But nobody got promoted unless they were Agile. So they created one year sprints so that they could say they were being Agile. I thought that was quite bright really, but it kind of like shows the gaming behavior. So decomposition and recombination is key to understanding how you scale any human-based process. And the trouble with things like scale is they try, and if you look at the, the SAFE diagram, it looks like a rather inadequate drawing of a chemical engineering plant, yeah, rather than a representation of a highly dynamic human organic system subject to continuous flux and change. Yeah, we, we actually map human systems using what, what are called fitness landscapes which are three-dimensional contour maps, which show where things are more likely and where things are less likely and how easy it is to make a change. Yeah, so the mapping techniques come from that environment. So that's a key thing on scale. And that's really what I'm arguing for. This is kind of like my third or maybe my part of the second point is we need to start to take a multi-methods approach in Agile rather than a single method. Yeah, the idea that there is one method to unite them all and in the darkness bind them, to quote Tolkien, is kind of like another fundamental error, um, although it does have all the aspects of Sauron about it in terms of what happens if you dissent. Yeah? I fondly expect, a, if, if you've ever said anything critical about SAFE, you find your attack by media orcs yeah, on your blog in large numbers. So there's obviously a metaphor here. Right? Um, so to give you an example, one of the things we're working on is to develop pre-Scrum techniques. Because Scrum is extremely effective in Kinevian terms, it's a liminal technique. It's very good and it's one of the best methods I've ever seen in software development, you know, say this all the time, at making complex things complicated once the initial definition is more or less worked out. It's not very good at extremely high levels of ambiguity because that's not what it's designed for. So to give you an example, one of the things we're now doing is to replace systems analysis with what are called trios. So we take a young prototyper. This is pulling off a DSDM method, by the way, of, of a JAD, RAD type JAD session. 
So we take a young, bright, fairly naive coder who's good at prototyping. We put them together with somebody who's a systems architect or an end system tester, somebody whose whole attitude is the whole system. And then a user trained to talk to IT people. And just to tell you, it's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than train IT people to talk to users. And I can tell you the cognitive neuroscience reasons for that, if you want. So that's a trio. We then throw 20 trios at a problem in their own time over two months and let them produce mini prototypes and ideas. And the ones which get accepted or fused be going to the backlog on Scrum. So you see what we're doing, we're creating a huge cognitive diversity in order to scan possibilities in the field. And we're combining users with two different types of IT people. So they'll come up with ideas that users wouldn't think of for themselves. And that also links in with a key principle, which is called inattentional blindness. And you all know this one probably because I use it a lot. If you give radiologists a set of x-rays and ask them to look for anomalies like cancer, and on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer module. On average, 83% of radiologists will not see it, even though their eyes scan it. And that just invalidates any approach to user requirements based on somebody going to interview people. Because you will only hear or see what you expect to see, no matter what your training is. So once we recognize that reality, you can see what we're doing with trios is to actually throw multiple small teams in parallel with highly ambiguous starting steps to see what comes out of it. And again, that sort of starts to feed into this multi-method approach. If anybody's interested in that, by the way, we're about to do a variation, which is called entangled trios, um, to try and cope with a mental health plague, which is about to hit the West in January or February. Um, you can see it already, you know, young male suicides are starting to go up like this in Germany and, and the UK. And that's an early indication of some major problems because COVID ain't going to be over for another year yet. And people are going to start to realize that. Yeah? So what we're doing is increasing network interdependency. So for example, we've got a trio, which is teacher, pupil, parent. And then we have multiple of those as a support group. And we have another one, which is teacher, social worker, health worker. So we take multiple roles and start to entangle them on a peer to peer basis, but the roles are actually formal so they can get access to the formal system. So we're trying to radically increase peer to peer support and make it easier to find small professional support early rather than traditional linear process. So that concept goes into other fields, but the user requirement is a key one. And the final point I want to make as I come up to the 10 minutes is for God's sake, stop talking about mindsets. I mean, th there are two words that the agile community uses to actually excuse really poor methods or really inadequate methods and really inadequate training. And one of them is to say the culture isn't right. And the other is to say you haven't got an agile mindset. Now, this is actually really, really poor not cognitive neuroscience. There is no such thing as a mindset. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, we're not bloody robots, for God's sake. Although if you meet some people from SAFE, the similarity with the Borg goes along with the similarity with Sora, right? Um, the reality is we're, we're constantly co-evolving co with other people and with the structures in which we sit. And the structures in which we work have far more impact on how we feel than any original mindset. You are not going to get your agile program to work by acting like an American Bible Belt preacher telling people they have to come to the mercy seat and confess their sins and adopt an agile mindset. It ain't going to work. Yeah, but you can see that sort of inheritance. In fact, I blame Billy Graham for an awful lot of what lot of is wrong with American management consultancy. It sort of inherits that preacher mentality. So get rid of the manufacturing metaphor. Realize you're dealing with entangled systems and you stale by decomposition and recombination. That means you've now got a technique to bring methods together. And by the way, Scrum is a method. It is not a framework. That's a misuse of the English language. Yeah. And for God's sake, you know, start to focus on how people interact rather than what sort of people you think they should be interactions matter more than things yeah and just hold that thought
Okay, that's your 10 minutes.